there. So today we're going to be talking um, in Genesis 15, and this is all about Adam's, Adam's, Abraham's uh, covenant that he makes with God. Abram, his name isn't Abraham yet, we'll get to that shortly, but his name is still Abram, and he is going to cut a covenant with God today, and this is a very important chapter. And glory be, Susan doesn't have her Bible up here. Um, Vicki, could you see if my Bible is in, is in the prayer room, my red Bible? Okay. If not, we'll have to start over. Because <laughs> I can't do this without my Bible. Yay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, Genesis chapter 15. It's, a, it's, it's not a short chapter, but boy, is this jam-packed with information um, that we need to have. So, um, partners of the covenant, uh, chapter 15, and then we'll look at Zephaniah and Romans if we have a, enough time. But um, PTSD, that's a common word to our 21st century uh, ears, uh, post-traumatic, help me, stress syndrome, you all know the word, uh, disorder, excuse me, and uh, it develops after some kind of a terrifying ordeal that someone might be involved in, either physical harm or to the threat of physical harm, maybe, kind of, it makes those uh, adrenaline, that adrenaline, uh, is that a hormone? Adrenaline? Is it a hormone? Cortisol? Just zoom right up to the top and it can't come back down. Um, and pretty soon you get kind of burned out. So a person who develops PTSD may have been the one who was harmed or the harm might have uh, been happened to a, a loved one or the person may have witnessed a harmful event taking place or it may happen to uh, loved ones or strangers. It happens all over the place. And Abram, if you will agree, from last week, Abram has just been through a very big ordeal. He went up, there was a, the First World War, and in the midst of that, he went up and got his, uh, uh, his family back, his Lot and his uh, family back, his nephew Lot. So, we're looking, this is what we're going to be looking at this week. <coughs> That's the con kind of the condition of Abram, perhaps, maybe not, maybe he was just Mr. Superman, I don't know, but we'll see. But Abram, at this point in time in his life, he's been in the land for several years, he has no heir, he's an old man with an old wife, God has given this, him this land and to his descendants, but he doesn't have any descendants yet, okay? So he has no heir and uh, no title deed, only a promise. Steve, when you go to a real estate closing, there will be a deed that is signed, right? A warranty, deed. A warranty deed, transferring uh, possession from one person to another. Title deeds, you even get the keys. Keys to the kingdom, if you will. So, um, here we go. We're going to be looking at this. God is the cure for post-traumatic stress disorder. I call this... Um, this chapter, and uh, we're going to look at God reassuring Abram here, verses 1 through 6. So, Steve, you're reading today. Verses 1 through 6. You're the guy. You got the microphone? You got it. Okay. The man with the mic. <laughs> After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I sheep, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? <laughs> and Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to them, to him, So shall your offspring be. 
Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So we could, thank you, that's good, one through six. We can go home now. There's enough information in those six verses that will satisfy you. This is like a banquet and you don't even know it. You didn't even know it, just passed in front of you, maybe. Let's unpack this a little bit and see how we do. Okay, so those three little words, not I love you, but those three little words change everything. Those three little words are after these things. After these things. That's how the verse starts out. Chapter starts out. Well, so your first question is probably, well, what thing? After these things. After Lot rescues Lot and his family and his possessions. After, he, after Abram meets Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God who blesses him. And after he turns, turns down King of Sodom's offer to take uh, the riches in battle. Okay, so verses 1 through, here we go, verses 1 through 6 are very busy with first time uses. And actually verse 1 has 6, verse 1 has 6 first time uses in it. <coughs> When I say first time uses, I mean the first time a word has been used in the Bible. And any time the, the, the word is used the first time in the Bible, it is, has extra uh, clout to it, if you will. Okay, so here they are. I don't think I made it up. Those made it out of your paper until after I printed off the paper. So I, I fixed up a different slide. But after these things... That's the first time that word was used, things. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Word and vision are is the first time they've been used. And the term fear not, Joel, <laughs> fear not, Abram, that's the first time that's been used. And of the 365 times I say that just for Joel, it, he says don't fear and fear not 365 times in the Bible. This is the first one. I am Abram. I am your she I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Well, that's, quite a statement. that's quite a statement. That is quite a statement. And I want to point this out to you. The word, the word I lost. Here is my duda. The word. Uh, in Hebrew, the word for, this is very funny. How many of you knew this? The word for things and the word for word is the same word. It's the word to bar. Our words are things. Your words are things. The words are things. That's why they carry weight. It's a thing. That's why you have to be careful. Because there can be good things and there can be bad things. There's like good words and there can be bad words. They do. They do. There's, there's, there's never-ending thing. That's one of the things that God, one of the things uh, <laughs> that God uh, enabled you with. It's one of the, it's part of being made in His image. He gave you the power of speech. Words mean, and they mean something. So debar, and if, and if we uh, make them plural, it would be debarim. Can you say debarim? Debarim. So debar and debar. Here's, here's the same word, letters here. And the eem on the end is like putting an S in English. Ever-eem. So, <clears throat> all right. Thing and word, same thing. So, the word, in verse 1, the word of yod heh came to Abram in a vision. Wow. Now, let's put a capital W on that, because the word came to him in a vision. If something comes to you in a vision, it's not just a word made up of letters, because who's you, who is the word of God? Yeshua. Yeshua is the word of God, right? So the word is a who. And Abraham met Yeshua in this vision that he had. And the vision, and in the vision it says he's, uh, Yeshua, or the, the word of God, uh, says, fear not. First mention. 
He said, Fear not, Abram, I am your sh thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And the shield is literally is the word uh, Megan. Ma Ma I, 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 Myra, where are you? <laughs> Magen, Magen. There it is. Magen, not Megan. Magen. And it applies a shield of a smaller size. Um, and it literally means to defend or to cover or to surround. You know, that's what a soldier would do. He would have his shield. Sometimes his armor bearer would have his shield out in front of him. And uh, that's exactly what God does with you. If, we, if you realize it, if you look, look into the spirit realm, God is literally, wa and you're following him, you're following after him, means he's walking in front of you and he is your shield. He's a shield to protect from harm those he has called, not only temporal in the, in the physical realm, but in the eternal realm as well. Okay? The, uh, over in Israel, um, we, on our ambulances here in America, we have a great big red cross usually, right? Over in, in Israel, their thing is not a red, they don't go with red crosses, they go with the Star of David, and it's called the Magen, Magen David, the Shield of David. Who is God? And that's on all their ambulances. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I'm your shield and your exceedingly great reward. There was very good reason why God said this. Abram had just, this is kind of addressing his mental health, maybe even, because uh, that was quite a, a, an ordeal that those guys went through last week. Abram had just uh, had success attacking a, very, a much larger army uh, from a confederation of four kings, and he had reason to be afraid for his security. There's marauding kings going all over the, the land of Israel. They would just um, go and attack. An attack of retribution was probably to be expected. Oh, they're going to come back and they're going to get me. They're going to back around and they're going to come back. That's what they would do in the, in the military, right? Yes, I got the guys all shaking head agreeing with me. Yay! God's telling him <laughs> that though he has sacrificed, God's saying that though, Abram, though you have sacrificed for, for, for my sake, for God's sake, he will not be the loser for it. How did he sacrifice for God's sake? For God's sake, how did he sacrifice? How did he do that? What did that look like? Okay, and also when he came back, he didn't take any of the stuff. He didn't. He didn't share in any of the plunder. He remember what his his statement to Bera was? I'm not going to take one string or one shoelace from you, lest anybody says you made me rich. Well, God's he's gonna God's gonna take care of that. Okay. After them, with a much smaller group. Yeah. 318. Remember the, the 18 stood for life and the 3 stands for justice. He was going giving God and giving God the glory. That's exactly right. Gave God the credit for it. So God is going, will make up uh, what Abraham has given up uh, in not taking any plunder. And God told Abram this because he was afraid. And he was afraid for good reason. I think I just said that, didn't I? Anyway, I think I just repeated myself. Okay, I forgot to take that one out. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All good. All right. This, here's another first. Uh, and this is in verse 2. And this, this is so subtle. And we can thank our English translators for this. Or hold them responsible for it. Let's put it that way. Okay. And Abram said, Lord God. Okay. Is that, is that what your Bible say? In yes. verse 2? Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing as I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Okay? But what it says in the Hebrew is not Lord God. How do I help you with this? Um, it, this is the first use of... Actually, it says... Yahuwah, my Lord, my master, Yahuwah, and 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 he said, uh, uh, and Abram said, Adonai, that's my master, 
That's like Lord Little with a little o, with a little O R D. Okay, my Lord, and what is and here's our Yod Hey Vav Hey. What is this? Yahweh. Yeah. Yahweh. Okay. Does this say Yahuwah here, right here? No, it doesn't. It says little Lord and and God. Okay. It literally is saying. Oops, the translators did not want to use Lord, little Lord and big Lord in the translation, so they used Lord God. And here where it's all capitals, the capital G. Joel, have you got this on the screen? Okay. The uh, capital G is the tetragrammaton in, in Hebrew, the yod heh vav -Heh. Okay. Okay, I'm going to say this again. This is the first use. This is the first use where a man said, Adonai Yahuwah. Now, you, now, if I were to give you a test, like a essay test or something, and and uh, and uh, we would go all the way to Moses in the burning bush. This is my memorial name. The data that shall be known. To, that's two hundred and some years later. This right here is the first time Adonai, my Lord, my Master Yahuwah, is used. That's amazing. Okay. It's, okay. So. Draw a big circle around chapter 15, verse 2. So Abram was establishing a relationship with, with uh, Yahuwah right here. And God is developing him. He absolutely is developing him. Yep. Okay. Okay, so Abram's asking him, God, uh, Lord Yahuwah, what will you give me? Seeing as how I go childless and the stewardess of my house, steward in my house, is this Eliezer dude from Damascus. If, if, so uh, Abram's uh, getting older, he doesn't have any kids, and, he, and if he were to die, then Dema uh, this Eliezer guy from Damascus is going to be inherit all his stuff. And uh, Abram's bold honesty before Yah is worthy of our uh, imitation. Sometimes we just have to wait for it. And we don't, you know, the, the old prayer, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. You know, <laughs> that old joke, you know. Instead of bottling up his feelings, he lays them out before Yah. Do you have any idea how, how welcoming and refreshing it would be for the Lord if you were to go to him and just be honest with him? Lord, I'm feeling really whatever. Fill the blank. This is what's going on. Would you please help me with it? He knows it, he knows it anyway. So why not just start in a dialogue with him while you're sitting there in your chair? You know, then ah, help me with this. Lord, I'm giving this to you. I'm putting it up on your table. Putting it up on your desk, you know. You can give it to God has a big inbox. He deals with things every day. Yep. But we don't have to be afraid of doing that. And God says to him, oh, here's the conversation. See, they're having a conversation. And God answers back, oh, but you will have an heir. And, and this heir won't be the steward from Damascus. Your heir won't be one born in his house. In other words, he's saying, you're going to have a son. Wow. Wow. Because if there was no son, the custom was for the steward. It wouldn't be necessarily uh, Lot. It wasn't a steward in his house. It would be the steward in his house that would uh, in inherit things. Okay? So, verse 6, we'll come down here. We'll see. Fear not, Abram, for I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. And he brought him forth, and, and he showed him. I'll, I'll look up there at the sky. And there weren't any lights to interfere with the number of stars in the sky. So he, when he looked up there, he, wow. Have you ever been out in the middle of the desert and seen? I haven't. I think one time I experienced that at a Feast of Tabernacles back in, 19, I don't know, 1997 or something like that. We were out outside of Estes, and the Milky Way was there, and... It was it was the most gorgeous thing. It was just like a carpet of stars. I, I'm, it's amazing. 
get away from the from the city lights. But he said, if you would be able to number them, he said to him, so shall your seed be. And I'm telling you, everybody that's sitting in a chair in this room today is part of that seed. You're, you're one of those stars. Okay, you are. You're part of it. You're yeah, part of his family. I read one. The sand is the physical seed of the stars. Well, there you go. <laughs> Little one's having a trouble today. And verse 6 here. This is the magical verse of the thing. And he believed in Yahuwah, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. This, cha this, cha this is another one of these big changing things in this chapter. He believed him, and he believed in Yahuwah, and, he, and Yahuwah accounted it to him for righteousness. <laughs> I brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to, for you to inherit this land. Okay. We hear that line again in chapter 11. Well, yeah, we're going to take a look at a little bit of a little bit of this here. This is one of the clearest expressions that he believed in Yahuwah. This is one of the clearest expressions in the Bible of the truth of salvation by grace through faith. Faith is like a really important word. Okay? Here. This is the first time believe. This is the first time believe is used in the Bible. This is the first time righteousness, the word righteousness, I know Noah was righteous, da 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 da, da but this is the first time righteousness is used in the Bible. Here, verse 6. So in the God, it is the gospel. This is the gospel of the Old Testament. This is the, I'm say that again, it is the gospel of the Old Testament. Okay? It's the gospel of the Old Testament. And it's quoted four times in the New Testament. Let's take a look at them. Somebody look up, grab chapter, Romans chapter 4, and somebody grab Galatians chapter 3, and we'll just look at these real quick. Romans chapter 4. It's on page 1230. You need that. We've got it. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Sonia, you got it? I don't. You don't? I got Oh, you got Galatians. All right. Got Romans? Romans chapter 4, 1 through 3. Okay. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something of which to boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as death. Okay, right there. The, it, it's an exact quote that Paul does does to him. It wasn't his. Abraham did. Abraham does winds up doing a lot of works because of his faith. Okay, which is what we do. It's not. It, this is where the Baptist pastor can get get you all tangled up and. <laughs> yes. You're not saved by works. No, you're not saved by works. You're saved by faith, just the way Abraham was. Okay? You have faith in the, in the God that, that you're learning about. Okay, how about um, 9 and 10? Are you still there? Yeah. yeah, 9 and 10. Romans 4, 9 and 10. 9 to 10. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Okay. We have not had any verses in here yet about Abraham being circumcised yet, right? His, no, this is before he was circumcised, and guess what? And his faith um, was counted to him as righteousness. He believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, there's two things. All right, let's go for the third one in 19 to 24. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced 
that what he had promised he was able to perform. Okay. <laughs> he's almost 100 years old and he's and it's counted to him as righteousness. God said it, I believe it, right? Okay, it's that simple. All right. How about uh, Galatians 3, 5 to 7? Who's got that one? Okay. Well, who does? Who's it? Okay, let's talk right in the microphone. Um, therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Okay. So, the caveat to that is, if we believe Abraham, then we're going to do the things that he gave Abraham and da 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 da, -da to, to do, right? Alright. All before circumcision, but... Believing God and believing his word, and his word is... God's word is, hello, God's word is who? Is a who, right? It's Yeshua, right. Yeah, here we go. Computer has decided to stop doing that. All right, so will your descendants be, Abraham? Exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what you can even imagine. An old man with an old wife uh, and a promise of a son and many descendants. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, let's do 7 through 12 and see this cut covenant. Oh, wait a minute. Wait just a minute before we do that. Yep, this is where to, this is where to do this. Okay. <laughs> you know those, those things on Facebook where the guy just holds up a cue card and you read it and, and to try to verify something here? Uh, somebody at, at uh, Myra's school did this for the kids at chapel. And uh, she gave, she made me a set, and I had them. What do you? This stuff is called you know, laminated, so they would be stiff. So we're just going to do this. Joel, you got the, you got the, so you can see it. Okay. Let's just have, um, let's have you read them with great, and I'm just going to let them drop one at a time. Okay, you ready? By faith, we can believe God is the promise keeper. By faith, we can obey God in things that might not make sense. By faith, we can trust God to protect us. By faith, we can understand hard things. By faith, we can follow God when others around us are not. By faith, we are able to make hard sacrifices. By faith, we can please God. By faith, we can go against the ways of the world. By faith, we can walk unfamiliar paths and do new things. By faith, we can trust Him with the things most precious to us. By faith, we can ask God for a big thing. There you go. Is that not true? It's all, it's all by faith, and it's all because Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. By faith, we can do these things. That's a gift from Abraham handed down to you. That's amazing. You didn't come up with... Nobody gave you... You can't come up with your own faith. It's a gift from God. Right? You didn't do that. <laughs> quote somebody <laughs> okay um, uh, 7 through 12 chapter 15 Steve he also said to him I am the Lord who brought you out of her of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of but Abraham said sovereign Lord how can I know that I will gain possession of it so the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, 
along with a young dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Okay. Whoa. All right. Let's see where this is going to be a neat trail. Okay. Um, so, uh, God says, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon, uh, each of three years old. So he brought them all. That was his part. He brought them, he killed them, and he laid them out. Just like that. Ah. This is called, it's a cut, cutting a covenant. He cut them in half, laid them out and on either side of a path, and all the blood was kind of flown into the path, just like this. Okay? Um, Abraham, he knew what to do because this was not brand new. This was not like, what? It wasn't like that. It was kind of like, okay, I know what to do. So he did it. And uh, note that God did not have to tell Abraham what to do with the animals, as this was a very common means of, co of uh, creating a covenant between a greater party and a lesser party. So we have the party of the first part and the party of the second part. Okay? And sometimes this is called, a, help me with the pronunciation, I think it's Sir Zandi. Does that sound right? Sir Ranty? Sir Covenant. And it, it, that, it's the, that's that kind of a covenant where it's between a greater and a lesser party as opposed to a parity covenant which is between two equal partners. Okay? Like, give you Steve as an example again, real estate. Uh, he's got a seller and he's got a ready, willing, and able buyer. They both can come together and right, have an agreement. This type of covenant is called the walk of death. <laughs> In this blood path ceremony, the lesser party, that would be party of, the, of Abraham, the party of the second part, right, um, provides the animals to be sacrificed, and the greater party, that would be the party of the first part, God, provides the terms of the covenant. He's going to give the terms. Then the lesser party kills the animals and drains the blood and the greater party then walks through the blood stamping his feet in the liquid to say if I do not provide what I promised you may do this to me as in you may kill me if I don't do the things that I'm saying that are party to the covenant and party are part of the covenant the lesser party then walks through the blood and says if I don't keep my end of the bargain, you may do this to me. I, you may kill me. Ooh, the plot thickens, so to speak. True? Okay, this is kind of what it looks like. They were doing it. Walking the blood path. Abraham fully expects God to come down and walk through the animal parts with him because God had previously appeared to him, had he not? All right. All right, how covenants were made or, or cut. Okay, here we go. Joel, you got this on the screen? Okay. Uh, the parties would walk up and down the blood path between the animals and recite the terms of the covenant, which included the pledge of their life one to another. Okay. They would then trade weapons and coats that symbolize their wealth and their power. This is what they're bringing to the table. Okay? Here, you take my coat and my weapon and I'll take your coat and your weapon. They'll trade them. They would combine their names together so that their clans became one. They would cut themselves, usually on the wrist, and then join their wounds together 
And this is how we got to be blood brothers. When we were all kids in the 50s, everybody had a, right? We all were going to do it. Well, I'm going to, well, tomorrow I'll do it. I, my mom's calling me home for supper. But tomorrow I'm going to prick my, right? And we'll become, right? Did that with your best friends, all the kids in the club, right? Yeah, you remember? In the bushes in the alley back behind, anyway. Yeah, down by the creek. <laughs> it's true. This it's it's a it's a it's a throwback to this. It's all it's in our DNA. You see, this covenant would last for generations, and it was punishable by death if broken. There was then a great feast, and the animals were eaten, and God was praised for the sacrifice and the covenant. Okay, now. You got the parts to the covenant? This is how a covenant was cut. Greater party, lesser party, trading this stuff. Now watch what happens. Let's just connect that. Lord gave me this this morning. I just thought this was really cool. How does this work out? Alright, so the first one, they would then trade. Can you see that? I hope you can see that. That's big enough. They would then trade weapons and coats that symbolize their wealth and their power. Okay? Looky here. How does this translate over? Remember last week we talked about bread and wine being a, being a weapon? <laughs> victory? Bread and wine are the means to victory over the enemy. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And he's also clothed us in robes of righteousness. That's what happens in the New Testament. That's what Yeshua came to do. All right? How about they would combine their names together? So both clans became one. This is where God puts H from his yod heh vav -Hey, takes the H from his yod heh vav -Hey, and he puts it in Abram to make the name Abraham. He gave him, he'll give him his name. Okay? The bread was, the bread was, uh, yeah, we studied that last week. Melchizedek came out and gave him the, the bread and the wine. When every time you, every I'm not kidding, well, I'm going to just reiterate this. Every time we have communion, that's a that's a that's a declaration of being one with him, but it's also declaring the victory that we have in Yeshua, what he did for us. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, they would cut themselves usually on the wrist and join their wounds together. This is how we get blood, brother. He was bruised for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes we're healed. Yeshua left his blood all over the place, all over Jerusalem. This covenant would last for generations and was punishable by death if broken. Over here he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them and, and that will, uh, I will not turn away from them to do good and I will put my fear, the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. And I think, what did I do with the Jeremiah? Where did it go? Here it is. Jeremiah 32, 40 is where that is. And the last one, there was a great feast and the animals were eaten and God praised, uh, was praised for the sacrifice and the covenant. And he had a great meal out of this. And this is out of Revelation 19. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. All the elements and all the bits and all the parts are there. And God says to, let's see, down to 17. Where did you read to? You read to 12. Okay, we're going to, I'm sorry. I'm going to shut up. And, okay, I almost gave it away. Okay, go ahead. Read 12 to uh, 17. Or 16. To six, through 16. Yeah. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own that they will be enslaved and mistreated with. But I will punish the nation that serves the slaves. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. The sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun has set, darkness had fallen. A smoking fire pot, a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, the 
of the Wadi of Egypt, to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gershashites, and Jebusites. Jebusites. Okay. So what God is doing, he, he essentially, this greater party and the lesser party, he has Abram, he puts him to sleep. And he says, Abram, I'm going to walk both ways down this walk of death. Okay? I'm going to, t I'm going to cover, I've got you covered. I've got you covered. This, your descendants that I just told you a, a, a few verses ago you're, are going to be as much as the um, stars of the sky. They're going to mess up. Oh, they're going to mess up. Something terrible. They're going to mess up. But I'm making this covenant with you and it's out of your descendants that the whole world is going to know who he is. Yep. <laughs> yeah. When you had that picture up there of cutting the covenant, yeah. the animal and the blood and then the priest's robe, it brought to my mind um, during Passover, they would uh, kill so many lambs, they say the blood flowed down the yes. side of Kidron mm -hmm. and you know, the priest would be covered in blood. And you think about when Jesus, that final covenant with Jesus um, and and the Killing the, the last lamb, the same finished, but it was the same thing that Elijah was running. <coughs> was running. It, and, and he was making a, a that's, that was him making a blood covenant mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have to do a thing other than say, thank you. And Abraham didn't have to do a thing other than say, thank you, when he woke up from his deep sleep slumber, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. but, and, and, and God, the smoking furnace, is going to go both ways, up and down that bloody path. And that's exactly what Yeshua did. The light, that the, the cloud and the light, the fire that, that led them through the wilderness came in a body that was prepared to make this sacrifice, to be the, to be the one that was to make the blood covenant. So, yes? No. Yeah. Christianity and it almost insists on making this a very sterile kind of a thing. So we just have a figure of him on. I looked at. I, I almost did a. I almost did a song that showed him like. And I and I decided not to do that, but maybe I should have. At any rate, <laughs> um, Abraham waits. For Yah to appear, to walk through this carcasses with him, um, to be the sign of the covenant, he waits. Abraham waited and he waited and the fowls came. Is that true? Fowls came upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. The vultures came. So who's, wheresoever the body is, uh, there the eagles will be gathered and eagles are vultures. By the way, I know that they're, uh, but they're majestic bird and all. But these and smaller carnivorous birds are the scavengers of warm countries, and they don't do not allow any flesh to remain uneaten. Okay, so doubtless when the victims presented uh, by Abram uh, were laid upon the altar, laid out, and they spied the bodies from afar and hastened to. To the sacrifice animals to eat them. That's their job. The vultures didn't know that there was a covenant being cut. They were doing their job. Clean up on aisle five. We got a big mess. <laughs> we got a mess, big mess going on. And they and and the article I was reading said that um, vultures. You will never see them. You will hardly ever 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 see them unless there's something dead on the ground. And there's something dead on the ground, and all of a sudden it's like, boom, out of magic. They're, all, they're circling. Because their job is to clean that up. Okay? There's something dead down there, and um, they're doing what they were created to do. Oh, that we would all do what we were created to do. Yeah. We were created to worship God. Okay? Why didn't God tell the whole thing that um, I don't, Well, Abraham had to do his part. Uh-oh, you okay over there? Okay, you're fine. 
Because while you're waiting, lots of things can happen. Abram was in no hurry to get home for supper. He's waiting. He's waiting for something to happen. He waited and he waited and he waited on God. And sometimes we have to wait to get an answer. We have to wait for him to act. But we can rest assured he'll never be late. He will never be late. So, this, this covenant is an agreement. And I want you to think about this. Um, the agreement, uh, this agreement when accepted by you after you enter your full legal name and click I agree, will create a binding and legally enforceable contract between you and Yodhe Bape. Okay? That's what you signed up for when you said yes. I, interesting question. I don't know. Therefore, please read this agreement carefully before clicking. I agree. Down here, right? Because the effect, the effective date of this agreement is the date on which you click the I agree button. It's a contract. It's a contract. It's absolutely a contract. You have a con covenant is a is a contracts can be broken. Covenants, on the other hand, cannot. Um, Let's see. That's exactly right. And all this stuff, all the breaking of the covenant is what the Torah is going to be about. We often don't think of uh, Moses as a prophet. He's a prophet. And he, he's written all this stuff down. This is what will happen. This is how God's going to bless you. And if you break this covenant, this is what's going to happen if you do. So all the biblical prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all those guys, when they were writing, they, were refer they weren't just making this stuff up. They were going back to the books of Moses because they knew what was in the covenant. And we had... Let's see. Um, in our f I've been saying this for 20-some years. In our fallen condition, we are kind of um, designed, or have become um, designed to forget we forget to remember what it is that, that God has given us to do. To be obedient to his word. Um, so this covenant, a covenant is considered a bond in blood. And it's sovereignly administered by God. God has the rights. Does he not have the right? He walked up and down the covenant. Both ways. While Abram slept. And he did it for you. He said, I'm gonna I'll be your substitute, Abram. When does that change? Did Jesus not make the substitute for us, the sacrifice for us? And, he, and, and, that, and that was done. And now there is no longer, ever, never, ever, a sacrifice for sin ever required. I love this. I just thought I'd throw this in for free. Connection fit. This account is not associated with an organization. Please contact your administrator. If you get into trouble, contact your administrator. The covenant is administrated by him. He's the administrator of the covenant. I hate it when I get that message. I never. I just go okay, and it goes away, and I don't know what to do. But anyway, importance of having is God is your administrator. There we go. Uh, okay, so if this covenant is broken, somebody's going to die. Is that not what we just went through? We just read that. If somebody's, may, if, if I break it, it may happen to me. If you break it, it's going to happen to you. That's what, that's what we read. But God did it both ways. So Abram could, quote unquote, kill God. We West, Westerners scoff at this idea, but in the Eastern picture being drawn for Abraham, and uh, he's an Easterner. However, if Abraham did, didn't keep his end of the bargain, God could kill him. Okay. Abram uh, was soon put into a deep sleep. Think Adam, that happened to him too. And God walked the path himself both ways. God walked for Abram and himself. Okay, so this was God himself um, doing the blood walk of the covenant with Abraham, with Abram, and the smoke and fire where he uh, appeared to the children of Israel in the future wilderness. It's the same thing. It's the same, the smoking pot, uh, the fire in the smoking pot moved up and down uh, the torch. I mean, uh, up and down the, the um, blood path.
in the middle. And Yeshua walked this blood walk for us too. As we just watch from the sidelines. Right? Because without the shedding of blood, there's a picture. There's no remission of sins. Hebrews 9.22. John 3.16. Uh, and 17 and Romans 10 8 to 10 it's, it's, it's all right there Yeshua is the, is the completer of this covenant because somebody broke the covenant somewhere along the line right? Ta-da. <laughs> I guess so okay Steve read through some of the stuff here so he said, uh, no for sure, that for 400 years, no for sure, yada, yada, no, that's surely no, that's where the word, Hebrew word gets repeated. Here's yada, and this, this is ta-da, but this is in the future. Yada, ta-da. Ta-da. <laughs> no, 400 years for sure, that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them, and they will... Uh, afflict them for 400 years. Okay? There's a prophecy. You guys, these got, kids are going to screw up. Okay? You're, you don't have any kids yet, and I'm just telling you right now, they're all going to screw up, and they're going to be down in Egypt for 400 years. Okay? Um, in Exodus, in, here's is in Genesis 12, 13, it says 400 years, but in Exodus 12, 40, it says 430 years. So what, did Moses make a mistake? No. No. Let's do the math. At what point in Abraham's life did the 430 years begin? And when did the 400 years begin? And the 430 starts with the sojourn of, of um, Abraham. It, everybody thinks that the children of Israel, Jacob's family, was down there for 430 years. That's not true. That's not true. Moses says 430 years. Let's see. If we were to look at it this way, it was 25 years from Abraham's entrance into Canaan to the birth of Isaac. <coughs> and then it was 60 years from the birth of Isaac to the birth of Jacob. This is all spelled out in, in, in the Genesis story. We have, you have to go back and you have to put it together. It was 130 years from Jacob's birth to his introduction to Pharaoh. And that's when, that's when the 70 came down. Okay, so it's a simple math program. If we add 25, 25 and 60, and 130, we get 215 years. It was 215 years from Abraham's entrance into Canaan to Jacob's introduction to Pharaoh. Okay, and they were 70 in number at the time. By the time of the Exodus, they were almost a couple million, right? So, it was 430 years from the promise Abraham to the exodus or the giving of the law. If we were to take this 215 years and subtract it from 430, we have another 215 years. So they were down there growing into a nation from 70 people into a nation of a couple million for 215 years. And it's really interesting because I remember reading... This is stretching back, and I don't think I'm, I'm not going to be too far off. But in 200 years, America had grown. I forget the. There were several million people. Da 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 da. da. It was about right. Anyway, seven. Yeah. Numbers wise, it works out. It was therefore 215 years from. <laughs> I just said that from Jacob's introduction to Pharaoh. Israel, the nation, was in Egypt for 215 years before the exodus with Moses, which we're going to celebrate in April, by the way. So, what nation do we, are we talking about? So, uh, the nation whom, what nation are they going to serve? I, the nation that they serve, I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. Uh, it's not spelled out here, um, they come out, but we have Ham in the fourth generation. Abraham didn't even have a kid yet, so here's uh, Abraham, this generation is one, two, his sons, and in the fourth generation, his sons' sons are going to be coming out of out of Israel. Okay, I mean out of out of Egypt. Excuse me. 
And then the ratification of this, this last part, sorry, this last part, the ratification, verses 17 to 21, is the ratification of the covenant. And uh, God's word becomes the title deed. And it literally says, unto your seed I have given this land, the river of Egypt, that would be the what river? The, Ni the river of Egypt would be the Nile River, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. That's the size of Israel. And we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that yet. Um, David almost saw it. But that's, yep, that's the title deed. There it is. And that's the, that would be the size of the land there. So we got a little bit to go yet. But first, these guys are going to have to go. Go ahead and pronounce them. Yeah, go ahead. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And I, and, and I counted them. We're, we're, God's always looking for ten righteous men. And these weren't them. <laughs> they got to go. <laughs> they they got to go. So they had a meeting, and, and it's going to go this way. And righteousness is going to be imputed to Abraham's people. And you are part of Abraham's people. That's amazing. I think I just think that's amazing. Da -da -da. Oh, yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. They got to go. And then this gets front and center. There you go. Okay. So let's take a. That's it. That's it for the chapter. And verses eight to twenty. Let's see what that has to say. Yes. Eight to twenty. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations to gather the kingdoms and to pour out my wrath on them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. How far? To uh, 20, actually. Mm -hmm. Then I will purify the lips of the people, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord, and serve Him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers may scatter my people will bring me offerings. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs that you have done to me, because I will remove you to an arrogant poster. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong, they will tell no lies, and deceitful tongues will not be found in their mouth. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment, and has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hand hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you, in his love, and he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove you, all who mourn, over the loss of your appointed testament, which is a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praises and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortune before your eyes. Quite a promise. There's a lot to be said for believing him and obeying him. And even within his own people, he shows two different lines, two different groups, right? Um, and I think Romans 4, we did, we did Romans, I think. We did most of Romans chapter 4, so I think we'll let that go with that. Um, Yep. 
John, John 6, 29. The work of God is this, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. That is the work of God. Yep. We have a covenant that's been cut. We have a God who's going to be the is going to substitute the walk. He's going to provide someone to substitute for when the Abraham's descendants um, break it. And that substitute was who? That, sub that substitute is a who. And who is the substitute? Yeshua. And he ha you are now clothed in his righteousness because you believe what Yeshua came to do. And now we're trying to we're trying our best to study this out and to see what it is that he wants us to do now that we're saved.